And we're on the road again as part of a 100-city tour now in San Francisco, California. But back in Washington, D.C., 400 people were arrested in a massive sit-in on the steps of the U.S. Capitol to protest the influence of big money and corporate lobbying in politics. We continue our coverage uh, looking at the influence of dark money by speaking with investigative reporter Lee Fong, a journalist at The Intercept, who focuses at the, on the, inter, the intersection of money and politics. His recent piece we'll talk about in a moment. But I want to talk about the protests that are taking place and what you're finding as you sniff the money trail on the presidential campaign trail, Lee. Well, Amy, uh, welcome to San Francisco. Thank you so much for having me. I thought the protests yesterday were very interesting, and they kind of connect to a, a broader movement, um, this kind of return to civil disobedience that we've seen in recent years, everything from Occupy Wall Street to the Black Lives Matter protests. You know, in the waning years of the Bush administration, we saw a lot of activists uh, shifting their focus to electoral politics, focusing on electing uh, Democrats or left of center politicians like Barack Obama. Um, but with some of the, uh, the failures of Obama, failure to achieve uh, real universal health care, uh, failure to really tackle climate change or growing income inequality, uh, we're seeing this kind of return. Uh, to civil disobedience, uh, these tactics uh, from the 1960s or even going back to the 1930s um, that are returning to the mainstream in American politics. And I think that's very interesting. And it, it's very savvy, I should add, uh, for all of these protesters to make uh, corruption, uh, money in politics, their, their focus, because that's what kind of threads the needle here. Uh, no matter what issue you care about, uh, it's very difficult to see reform uh, when uh, big money, special interests dominate the policymaking process. Uh, Li Fang, you write about a significant number of superdelegates are also lobbyists? Yeah, so um, there's also a focus now on the way the Democratic Party nominates its candidate uh, for the presidency. Uh, there are uh, about 4,000 pledge delegates, uh, folks that uh, are committed based on how each uh, primary or caucus state votes. But there are also um, a little over 700 unpledged delegates, uh, known as superdelegates. Most of these are uh, members of Congress, uh, but some of them, a significant number, are actually party insiders uh, or uh, lobbyists and, and former politicians who now work in the lobbying industry. So it's very interesting to see this broader discussion, really, in both parties about the role of money in politics. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, actual lobbyists, folks who are registered to represent uh, big banks, even in some cases foreign governments, and they have incredible power over the nomination process. And, and, uh, in one uh, potential scenario, uh, you could have these lobbyists uh, selecting the nominee if uh, Hillary and Bernie have about the same number of pledge delegates going into the convention later this summer. You've also written about Hillary Clinton's uh, ties to fracking internationally. What do you mean? Well, yeah, this is an, an interesting subject. And as um, uh, both candidates, Bernie and Hillary, uh, discuss fracking, I think this is an important element of the story uh, the mainstream media has not uh, covered very closely. Um, Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, in, in her time at, at the State Department, uh, there's been a lot of focus on her uh, role in Libya and the Arab Spring, but uh, a significant part of her legacy is really uh, of promoting American-style fracking across the world. Uh, she, in fact, um, reorganized the State Department to create a whole new bureau, uh, a 60-plus uh, staff uh, bureau focused on energy resources with a special focus on promoting uh, fracking. And she traveled the world, uh, partnering with American companies like Chevron, going to uh, countries such as Bangladesh, um, Papua New Guinea, um, Bulgaria, and uh, uh, convincing these governments to take this American technology, um, this directional drilling, um, uh, hydraulic fr uh, fracturing, known as fracking, and trying to convince these countries to adopt American-style fracking. So this is a significant part of her legacy. And as we talk about the role of um, fossil fuel money in politics, of where she stands on these important issues, uh, I think her, her uh, role and her uh, legacy of the State Department is, is important to scrutinize. Hmm. Uh, Bernie Sanders has proposed a national ban on fracking. Yeah, and that, that's a, a very clear-cut issue. Um, Hillary Clinton has um, uh, 
a, a less than clear position on this. Uh, in recent days, uh, I believe uh, with, with her uh, recent interview with the New York Daily News, she said that she would um, defer to some states and municipal governments that might ban fracking, and that in some cases uh, she would uh, 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 hope for fracking that is uh, environmentally sound, that um, is, is well regulated. But we really haven't seen a scenario where uh, fracking is closely regulated. Um, we still haven't. Uh, the federal government doesn't have a handle on how uh, methane is leaked from these fracked gas well sites. Um, of, of course, uh, methane is a, a, a very powerful greenhouse gas. So for uh, Hillary Clinton to take a position that she would allow fracking in an environmentally sound way um, is, is troubling, because we still don't have those regulations. Um, Lee Fang, you've also written about pro-TPP op-eds remarkably similar to drafts by foreign government lobbyists. Yeah, so we've had this big debate over the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, this massive uh, trade deal um, uh, uh, being negotiating now. Uh, uh, of course, part of this debate is in the public realm, right? Um, news programs, newspapers covering the debate, uh, trying to explain it to, to readers. Um, but we found a number of op-eds in California newspapers that were lifted directly from lobbyists uh, working for the Japanese government, uh, who are retained by the Japanese government to promote the TPP. So as we talk about money and politics, it's important to realize, um, you know, campaign contributions, Citizens United, are only one small part of the, the puzzle here. Um, if you're a special interest, or in this case, a foreign government, um, you can buy out a think tank to produce reports, you can pay off uh, uh, PR consultants to place these types of op-eds in newspapers. Um, you can control the policy-making process in so many different ways that it's important to, to realize that, you know, the media is part of the problem here.